There are over 500,000 kids in foster care across the United States, and making sure they're well taken care of takes a village. I'm Erin Lindstrom, and this is Foster Care Aware, a production brought to you by Tidewater Friends of Foster Care with support from the Barry Robinson Center. If you've had it on your heart to become a foster parent, volunteer, donor, advocate, or just want to learn more, you're in the right place. For more information on how to move forward, head to fostercareaware.org slash next steps. And now I'm thrilled to share today's segment with you. Hey, I'm Erin Lindstrom, and I am joined by Audra Bullock, the founder and director of Tidewater Friends of Foster Care, and John Murray, the CEO and founder of Families First of Virginia. John, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. This is a very um, special segment. Audra and I have been so excited to record. Um, today's John's going to be sharing with us all about trauma and the brain. And this is a big part of the training that um, families who sign up through Families First to foster go through and learn about. And it gives a really incredible perspective about what's going on for in the brain and mind of a foster child um, and really in everyone's mind who goes through trauma. So there's this really cool learning that happens here where you gain a new perspective. And so, John, I'll kind of pass this over to you. Can you start us off and tell us a little bit about uh, how trauma affects the brain and what does that mean? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, when you're just starting and understanding how children's brains develop, the natural attachment cycle that happens when a child feels discomfort, every single time the caregiver gives some type of action that makes the child feel more comfortable, it literally stimulates a part of the brain called the hippocampus. And the reason that's so important is because that's where your long-term memory is stored and it helps other parts of your brain start to develop such as sensory cortex and your prefrontal cortex. They're right here and right here. The reason I'm explaining that to you is because children that have trauma history, these two areas don't get proper blood flow and activity because the brain stem is so active, it literally alters how that child's brain physically develops and functions. And so parents that are working with children that have trauma history, they really need to understand the target. When I say target, like your aim should be precise and you should know what you're trying to do. It isn't just a matter of loving and caring for a child, but truly aiming the part of the brain that needs a lot of stimulation. So the more pleasure experience the child has with interaction with a caregiver, the healthier the brain. And for my children, and I say my children, the children I've worked with for 30 years, their, brain, their brains look physically different. Like you scan their brain, their amygdala, which is right back here in the limbic part of their brain, or the temporal part of the brain, depending on how you look at it, is actually overdeveloped. And it's, it's basically hijacked the brain to where it stopped information from getting here and eventually coming here. So if parents don't understand that all they see is behaviors, and if you chase those behaviors, you're really not looking at what's happening inside your child's brain. Like you really need to understand your role. It isn't just a matter of loving and caring for them, but truly saying certain things and responding in certain manners actually repairs that brain. Great news. Brains will heal themselves if in the right environment with the right circumstances of a parent well-equipped. So it isn't a matter of fixing the brain if something happens to it. It's actually putting an environment where it can actually feel safe enough and the approach is the right way. The brain will rewire itself in literally 18 months if you use specific techniques and you adjust your environment for the needs of the child. Old school thinking was like, I'll, I'll make the child adjust to my environment and I'll, I'll, I'll teach the child how to soothe themselves. Mm. doesn't work like that you know science proves today that babies don't have the capacity to soothe themselves and here's some other news about that neither do teenagers or young toddlers or children 10 years old they don't have the capacity once they experience discomfort they don't have an efficient way of calming themselves down and understanding it's a small problem or there are solutions to the problem so for us interacting with parents who are considering fostering and adopting, you really have to know a lot about neurological understanding of how people process normally and how it's altered because of that abuse. I love that, John, because that gives 
parents an expectation and some tools that they can use to be successful. I mean, I think that's where a lot of people endeavor into foster care and kind of quit early on because they feel overwhelmed. They come to the table with a lot of love in their heart, a lot of space in their home and emotional energy for these kids. And they, it, it, it gets missed, right? It, it's, it's lost in translation because they're speaking one language and there's a totally different rece reception of that language um, in the child's uh, mind because it's just talking past one another. Um, the other thing I really love about what you say is the time frame, setting expectations. You know, um, 18 months is a long time and, and we in foster care cases routinely see this kind of honeymoon period, right? That lasts maybe a few weeks and we think things are going well and all of a sudden they're not. Um, and then it, it seems like it's never going to get better. But I love that if we set expectations, right, that it's a long journey and it takes showing up. It's not a hard thing to do if you have the right mindset and understand that you have to look past all these behaviors and and hold space with these children i think it's beautiful well i appreciate you looking at it that way uh, you know in my frustration and i'll say this over the years the frustration was exactly what you're saying like people want to be successful they come with great intentions with love and time and investment for the children but they don't know what they're doing because they're basing it on other experiences that are completely opposite of these children not that they're not lovable, not that they're not capable, they're just like any other child in that category, except their brain doesn't hear the language you're speaking. It doesn't process it like you and I are having a conversation. You can reason with me and we could talk through it. We could control our emotions to the point where we're still communicating. Once they reach that point, that's gone with them. And if you still continue to stay in this realm of I'm going to teach you in a certain manner, and when I say in a certain manner, most parents are teaching through consequences. That's how most parents are using the tools that they have. Leverage, you know, I'll use this phone as a way to make sure that you're behaving a certain way so that we can get along. That would work well with a brain that is well adjusted and regulated. It does not work well for a brain that has trauma history. You cannot just use leverage and cause and effect. Because cause and effect would go like this. It would start here, go here, then here. Can't move like that in a brain that has that trauma history. It has to be soothed like the baby. You know, we literally, I don't care what age we're talking about, we literally have to go back to when a child is first born and they're proven that the parent can care for them. Like it has to be proven. And, and the mother who's now pregnant has nine months of an advantage with proving that already, where everybody else stepping right in the middle of the game and they don't have those nine months to feel connected. And a child that doesn't understand those kind of relationships, you get your honeymoon, but you also get pushed away quite a bit at the same time. That's just a weird feeling for a family to go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. It's, um, you know, I, I, I I, I've experienced that in my own home, John, and in you've helped us, uh, my family, a lot in trying to cope with some of the behaviors and some of even regression as more trauma is introduced throughout the foster care case. Um, and it, and it, it's, it tell us some of the techniques that you've told us, uh, okay. my family, of how we um, deal with behaviors, how we meet those, and how we move forward. Okay. First technique that we most people need to start with is you have to start with an empathetic approach of responding to behavior. And even if it's positive or negative, I want you to be able to connect with them at an emotional level. And that's a, a very simple statement, an empathy statement, like uh, that's got to be hard when they're struggling. You say that statement and you wait. You don't continue to try to explain it so they can understand cause and effect. You just, it's like a mic drop. You just say your empathetic statement and you wait. Sometimes you literally have to wait days. And that might sound strange to both of you, but it's just weird how every child's a little bit different. Sometimes it's just a matter of 10 minutes. So you say your empathy statement and the empathy stimulates that hippocampus I was talking about earlier, which creates a positive connection between you and I. If I say, I know that must've been hard for you, Audrey, when you were reaching out for your child and she kept pushing you away and you're like, Yep. And you, you, 
you and I connected at that point. That means I have stimulated your hippocampus to where you feel safe to communicate with me. Adults know that all the time. Children with this history, they don't understand that. That's, that's foreign to them. And if you continue to use that technique, it actually helps those levels of cortisol come down and adrenaline come down in the brain to where they can start to process. That's when the talking, the talking starts. And that's when you allow the child to fix the problem for themselves. And that is possible once they get about school age, by the way. But that soothing is your first response. And it doesn't matter how negative the behavior is, doesn't matter what the acting out behavior is, we have to soothe first. We do that well with babies, but we stop doing that when they become school age and we think they have the capacity. And maybe they do for a child who's well adjusted and has a healthy brain, but even then that's not very efficient. But for these children, we're talking teenage years or maybe older, quite frankly, before they really are efficient in soothing themselves or have the capacity to do it. So that empathetic state would be your first technique that you would try and master that before you start with other techniques. Like uh, my advice is go, go a full month with using that empathetic statement. It's like a one-liner. That must be hard. You say it from your heart. You don't say it when you don't feel it. And then you wait. Sometimes you might wait by saying if you want to talk and you literally go in the other room and give them space. Sometimes it's just sitting and being present and not talking. Mm. I love that. And empathy, it's so, it's interesting to hear like, oh, this is exactly how you practice empathy. Because I think a lot of times it's a concept that we don't really know. So I appreciate you kind of grounding that in. And here's how we do it with a mic drop moment. Um, one of the things that um, I've heard you speak about before, and I think this is um, even more of kind of like sitting in that empathetic space, um, is the 10 20 10 thing, so to speak. Could you speak more about that and kind of share with our viewers? Everybody loves 10 20 10. That's yeah. from, uh, that comes from Brian Post, by the way. People want to look that up online. And it's, it's what it is, is a formulated process so the children know what to experience each day. So 10 minutes in the morning, you sit present with your child. You do not ask questions. You do not prepare them for the day. You're not, you're not engaging with a dialogue. You're sitting present. It could be at breakfast or as they wake up or as they're in their bedroom, depending on their history. And you're spending 10 minutes in close relationship where your brain is regulated and calm and you're influencing their brain at the same time. So, right? so we're, we have these feedback loops. Even on Zoom, we have these feedback loops where we're literally able to feel each other's emotional state. It's more efficient in person, but right now that's all we can do Zoom-wise. But in person, when you're parenting a child, the closer you are physically in comfort, like you know, as, as comfortable as you are and they are, mm -hmm. the more feedback loop you can create with your child. So you spend 10 minutes, don't ask questions. I'm gonna say that probably three or four times because people like to ask questions. And that's it. If they wanna talk, they can talk. But if they don't wanna talk, you're just sitting present. Then 20 minutes when they get home from school, and I know that's a, a weird thing to say right now, but somewhere in the afternoon, you'd spend 20 minutes in the same manner, not firing off questions. Eating is a good way to use this technique, by the way, because that's soothing and it connects people. You know, it doesn't have to be around food, but I don't want TV. I don't want electronics. I don't want a bunch of people around. I want it one-on-one, -on -one, if possible, for 20 minutes, okay? So now we've worked up to 30 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time, and we're still in the afternoon. And then before they go to bed, you, you get them again with 10 minutes of the same interaction. You're putting them to bed. Uh, could you read them a story? You could. I prefer, I prefer more of just being present. If they want to read to you, that's really good, by the way. But just being present. Uh, I tell my false parents all the time, uh, put your child to bed and he's 18. They're like, what? I don't mean tuck him in necessarily. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, some quality time, people right? want that. Mm -hmm. they, they, they need to go back to that, that kind of schedule. And that's okay. That's healing. But being present before they go to bed and they're experiencing relationship and brain regulation at the same time. 40 minutes, you add that up, 40 minutes in a day for 18 months. Now the brain rewires itself when it looks at a caregiver 
it now stimulates the right part of the brain called the hippocampus, where before the amygdala was going off, the alarm system was going off like this. Every time they heard or saw a caregiver, it goes like this constantly. And that is a big problem when you're not in danger and the executive functions of your brain just shut down. This is what causes acting out behavior and disconnection and people not feeling connected. I've seen that, John, it, it, with my with my foster son and now my adopted son. Literally, he uh, shuts down and cannot answer a question, particularly under pressure. And, you know, it, it's been a struggle in, you know, not necessarily in our home. Early on, you pointed that out to me, and, and I, it was an awakening for me. But in situations like out in schools where there are these pressure points and he's expected to um, kind of comply on demand and and all of a sudden, you know, very simple questions like, what's your favorite color? He's, he's listing numbers, right? I mean, he can't, that executive function, it is literally shut down. So it's really helpful for parents to understand this, um, to be able to also help educate the village around these kids that, you know, we're, we're a little bit different. Our families are a little bit different. We look maybe the same, uh, we act the same, um, but we have different uh, approaches that work for getting us into a sweet spot of, of executive functioning. And it's taking time and holding space and connecting before correcting, spending that time and that relationship because for these children that have had relationships severed, they're terrified that every relationship is gonna be severed. And so that's what they, see and this is a defense mechanism so we have to take extra time um in in working with these kids to make sure that they're comfortable so that they can move along and when that happens my gosh we've seen miracles happen mountains moved it's incredible yeah you said a beautiful statement um you know you're connecting before you're correcting that's unusual for most of us like we're used to correcting something right away because we're our fear mechanism, our alarm system goes off as parents. We think if we don't correct it right away, they won't learn. But really, if you look at it from an educational component, your, your executive function is, is what allows you to learn efficiently and effectively. And if you connect first, then you're more efficient in learning. It's like, uh, let's, I was terrible in math. So if I had, I had one uh, algebra teacher, she would make everybody come to the board and, and work out the problems in front of everybody. I was terrified absolutely terrified couldn't handle it so I didn't do well I failed you know, I'm, I'm saying this on uh, recorded uh, <laughs> I failed algebra one the first time I took it my second teacher when I took it was different she would say John come sit with me and let's work together she says you know not being well in math is not a big deal you're bright in other areas this is just one problem it's not a big deal come sit with me and we'll work it out together got to be, which was a miracle for me because that's not the way my brain works. And mathematically, I'm, I'm just, I'm not well gifted in that area. But it was the connection of that teacher as I'm sitting here talking about, it, I'm literally feeling the emotional state that she put me in, which allowed me to learn. Mm, I love that example too, because I think we've all had that one teacher that like there is that connection with that we remember fondly because they did connect with us. That's bigger than just learning or you know, respond to what I'm saying. And that connection was actually there. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about doing the work of, of healing, right. And trauma healing and working with the brain in particular is that it actually changes the adult as well as the child. Right. Yeah. A, a, a lot of people came to help the children. Well, right. In fact, help happened for them is they became healthier in their cognitive state and they're more efficient and as i said earlier their aim gets better because their target's different it's not about controlling that behavior but actually teaching that that whole saying of discipline what does that really mean discipline is about teaching is not about punishment and when mm -hmm. people move out of that they stay in relationship differently also which is healing for them because i have a lot of families that come with their own history and they're looking a way to be healed too, and they're not even aware of that. But the gift that came was they got healed in ways that they didn't even know they had problems with. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely incredible. John, one of the things that, I, that you've said to me in the past that I, it really resonated with me um, was that this is for 
the adults, right? This is for, this isn't about, you know, necessarily fixing a child. It's about giving adults tools. And I, and I think that that's particularly helpful. And you're, you're right. It, when you get in, when you step into that realm and it's, it's a small shift, right? It's, it's just a, an ever so slight shift of looking through a different facet of this, this gemstone. Um, you get perspective that helps in relationships um, outside of that with your foster child and, and makes you stronger and gives you stamina. And I do, I go back to, I think a lot of people do come forward with big hearts and, and this is the stumbling block, not being able to make that shift. So um, I, I'm so grateful for having um, you, one in our area that we, we know you and that for you sharing all of your, your wisdom, you've, you've been at this for a long time. And I know that you go around and give seminars on this topic um, a, a lot. And we're just really grateful for you sharing this knowledge with us. My pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If people are listening in and they're either interested in fostering and learning these techniques to be able to support um, the foster youth, or if they want to catch a seminar or something like that, where should people go? What should they do to learn more um, and get access to the John Murray? Uh, I'm, I'm old school. I, I'll, I'll give out my cell phone number. Uh, it's 757-450-7329. That's 450-7329. You can call me anytime. You can text me. Uh, this is something that's much more than a profession to me. Uh, I'm going to sound like a minister now, but it is truly a calling for me to uh, try to be involved in people's lives and help them in a way that I feel is needed. Uh, you know, and science is behind what I, and I've tried all kinds of different things. It is truly, once you understand what a healthy brain looks like and should act like, that's your goal. And people respond very well to that. And anytime somebody wants to reach out to me, I'd be happy to talk to them. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing. And have a beautiful rest of the day. Thank you all very much. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you. And a big thank you for listening. Foster Care Aware is all about spreading the word about how we can help the kids who are in care in whatever capacity works for you. Tidewater Friends of Foster Care is here to help support you through the journey. Whether you want to be a foster parent, volunteer, donor, or advocate, head on over to fostercareaware.org slash next steps to learn more.